So this is Steve Gable from Honeywell. Uh, so the title of our project is um, Automated Demand Response for Energy Sustainability. And the subject that we addressed in the project is Automated Demand Response and its application to enable improvements in energy efficiency and sustainability at military installations. So I'll go on to slide number two here. And this, this slide shows a, a high-level overview of the project. The technology that was de demonstrated in this project is Open ADR, which stands for Open Automated Demand Response, which is an open industry standard communication protocol for transmitting messages between electric utilities or grid operators and electric customers. Uh, this technology, Open ADR, enables military installations to participate in utility, retail, demand response programs, as well as electric grid wholesale energy markets where available. One way to participate in these programs is by offering or bidding demand-side resources at the installation, for example, being willing to shed or reduce elec selected electric loads, and then responding automatically using this technology to dispatch control signals from the utility or grid operator. So this open ADR technology provides a standard way to send and receive these communication commands needed to automate the process. And it's this automation of demand response that um, makes this more reliable than manual methods and also enables greater uh, levels of uh, participation. So th this process is shown on the right-hand side of the slide here, and we'll be looking at this in more detail in the uh, coming slides. So uh, our military installation partner on, the, on this project is Fort Irwin in California. Other key technical members of the project team included the Army Construction Engineering Research Lab and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. We also received uh, very good support from Southern California Edison, which is the electric utility uh, provider for Fort Irwin. So our project demonstrated automated demand response participation in SCE's demand bidding, or DBP, program. Um, and we've collected test data and analyzed it against a set of technical performance objectives and have also prepared a cost assessment of the economic performance in an example application scenario. So uh, looking at the, the technical and performance results, we had sought a, a full season of, perform of uh, DBP at uh, Fort Irwin. Um, we weren't able to get a whole season. We got part of it, but we were, were able to show the concept and potential. Um, hurdles, we did have a couple of hurdles along the way. Um, uh, one is we had originally sought to demonstrate the technology using an ancillary services tariff to be um, offered by the utility, but due to regulatory delays, uh, we had to switch to a utility uh, demand response program, the DBP program. Uh, we also had some delays uh, early on with our interim uh, authorization to operate certification, um, so that delayed us a little bit. And then um, along the way, sort of operationally, we um, ran into a challenge at times uh, accessing our server uh, uh, at the uh, NEC data center. Um, turns out that for to, to install, commission, and operate these uh, kinds of systems, you need to have you know physical access and log on access to the to the server that's built around and and in the case in this case uh, it was um, housed in the data center and so um, it wasn't as accessible as we normally see it in um, in the commercial sector so not a problem it's just a small hurdle uh, in terms of technology transfer um, this uh, open ADR is a standard it's applied in commercial sector and is ready for application to military installations uh, where supported by utilities and grid operators. So that's a quick overview. I'll move along with the other slides now. So next slide is the project team here. I mentioned um, some of the uh, organizations involved. Uh, this slide shows the roles of each of the organizations. Um, I think they're pretty self-explanatory, so I won't go through them. Um, Key members on the team were Melanie Johnson from um, the Surro Lab, um, Janie Page from LBNL, and from the installation, um, Hossam Kassab from DPW. 
So moving along to the next slide shows, the next couple of slides uh, present some of the technical background in the project. So the, the overall uh, vision here, the idea is that using this open EDR technology, uh, we can participate in demand response programs from utilities or grid operators. From that comes um, credits to utility bills or some other way of um, achieving an economic benefit. And then um, those dollars can be used to procure other kinds of renewable energy projects, energy storage, uh, conventional energy con conservation measures. And it's out of those measures that come the energy benefits. So this is kind of the process uh, uh, that out of which come these sustainability benefits we talked about. And this is all being driven by um, uh, a need that installations have to have to to find more resources to uh, to meet those uh, objectives. Um, and at this point in time, uh, there were there are emerging uh, ancillary services market opportunities that offer a new source of funds uh, to fund these improvements. And uh, aside from that, um, utility DR programs are seen as a vehicle for customers to participate in these markets as well. Okay, additional background. Um, the smart grid relevance here is that um, there, there, this uh, graphic is taken from the NIST uh, smart grid interoperability panels uh, framework and vision for the smart grid of the future. And so one part of that is uh, customers participating uh, in this market grid, and so I've uh, highlighted here, you know, the focus of this project and, and how the project relates to the smart grid vision um, in general. A couple more slides of background here. Slide number six shows, um, it's kind of a busy slide, but it shows how demand response fits in with sort of the timeline of um, grid operations and specifically how the programs that we were looking at, um, the, the answer services, uh, as well as the demand bidding, which we uh, demonstrated the project using, how they fit into operations um, of the grid. Then another look at that is shown in the next slide, which just illustrates the, the um, interaction between electric customers, military installations in this case, and either the um, grid operator in the wholesale markets, or in our case, as we demonstrated here in this project, um, interfacing with a retail um, demand response program offered by um, the electric utility. Okay, next slide, additional background about the demand bidding program. SCE, like other utilities, offers a number of demand response programs that come customers can participate in if they wish to. Uh, the way the DBP program works is there's um, uh, a day before the event, there's a, there's a notification of a pending event that, that will be occurring. Um, that information is, is sent to the uh, electric customer uh, through um, email, uh, phone, fax, as well as through this uh, open ADR communications mechanism. Um, and then in response to that, the customer is able to um, update their bid of how much um, load shed they want to offer. Uh, they don't have to update these bids every, every uh, event, but um, they are able to do that. And then uh, the next day when the event occurs, the response is measured, and then credit is given for uh, load sheds uh, between the range of 50% and plus 100 or 200% of the hourly bid amounts, and those are uh, measured and then uh, settled at some point after the, after the event, and then uh, credit is made to the bill. So that's how the DBP program works. So I'll move on to the uh, objectives of the project here now. So the problem statement is that, as I mentioned, Installations need uh, more funding resources to meet their objectives, and Open ADR can uh, enable this participation and provide a new source of funding. Uh, the baseline we uh, are comparing against here is to measure cost and performance benefits against the base case of no participation in automated programs. 
And the technical objectives for the project were to demonstrate how uh, building loads at the installation can participate in automated programs uh, to implement the OpenADR technology at Fort Irwin and to generate the supporting cost and performance data for acceptance and validation of the technology. This last bullet really is um, pretty much you know, an objective of all, all the uh, ESTCP demonstration projects, as you know. So the next slide shows the performance objectives that we had outlined at the start of the project and the results. Um, I, I won't go through all these right now. Um, we'll come back to some of these in later slides um, unless anyone has any questions about them at this point. Okay, so I'll move on now to describe the technical approach. On a number of slides, this is a graphic taken from, um, from the earlier slide, but this shows the, uh, the concept here is that uh, the loads at the installation are available for um, use in demand response programs. At the installation, we have a uh, building energy management system. We have an, an energy manager install at the installation who is overseeing all of this. And there is communications with the utility um, to uh, send up information about the, the bids and the loads that are available and receive dispatch signals from the utility. And if it's a wholesale program, um, information coming from the grid operator, same sort of information going up to the operator about what sort of um, demand response um, uh, capacities are available, and then um, signals coming down from the uh, grid operator. So next slide, number 12, shows the loads that we controlled at Fort Irwin, basically three central cooling plants, which were selected together with DPW after doing a demand response audit of the installation and reviewing the uh, opportunities there. So these were the these are a couple of photos taken of um, some uh, parts of the installation used. And so also shown here is a little um, map of the cantonment area and the uh, locations of these uh, central cooling plants. So next slide number 13 is just a little more uh, detail about these. Uh, central cooling plants, the chillers that are in the plants, the size of them, uh, some of the control capabilities. We, they can be controlled using a current limit setting, which is what we used in this case, and they can be controlled down to um, these set points here, 40% or 60% in one of them, um, and then some information about the uh, data manufacturing and so forth. So this is a quick overview of the loads themselves. Okay, moving along to number 14. Uh, some notes here about the demonstration. Um, we, these buildings did not have energy storage equipment. Uh, that's, energy storage is sometimes a good feature capability to have for demand response programs, but we didn't have it in this case. Uh, second thing, pre-cooling strategies are another thing that people use often with demand response strategies. Uh, we couldn't do those in this case because we we didn't have networked building controls to the um, air handling units and other you know, endpoints of use of uh, the cooling. Uh, so that wasn't something we could do here. It didn't detract from our demonstration. It's just uh, something that wasn't available to us here. So, uh, and also in terms of the demand response strategies, we limited to the chillers only. We did not extend to the associated equipment, the condenser water pumps, cooling towers, and, and so on, as is done sometimes in other projects. Uh, um, so uh, as I mentioned, um, the fourth bullet here, the control input used here to accomplish this, this uh, load shedding was the um, current limiting uh, control input. Uh, to the chillers, and so with this, we're able to command a maximum operating point or load for each of the chillers. So, um, and I'll show later on here a couple of slides um, how this is done. But basically, the energy manager at the installation is able to select a um, maximum setting for for these chillers by hour during the event, 
And so uh, that uh, when the event occurs, the chiller, the signal is sent to the chiller, the chiller is limited to um, go up to that level of, uh, of, uh, of current or, in, uh, in effect, kilowatts, but uh, it's limited to that. So that's how the control was done. Um, a couple more notes here. Uh, we, we, the condition of the chillers and the actual cooling loads at the installation did limit the scale of the reductions that we were able to accomplish during the demonstration, and you'll see later uh, something about that. Uh, a couple of notes here. Um, due to some delays in the project, some of the control actions that, that we uh, performed during the demonstration were done in a sort of semi-automated fashion. In other words, were performed manually at the equipment. Um, another point, we did not submit bids to Edison during the demonstration period. The reason for that was that uh, DPW is participating manually in the DPP program with, and they had been since around 2009, with a number of much larger loads. And so they were bidding those larger loads and the things we were doing into Edison. So um, we didn't, um, weren't involved in, in the bidding uh, process in the, in the demonstration here. And lastly, the control actions we took here were conservative. Um, at the recommendation of DPW so we wouldn't adversely affect uh, building occupants. But they're certainly open to explore more aggressive settings in the future. Okay, moving along to the next one. This is an overview of the user experience here. So the energy manager at the installation has basically three use cases. Um, one of them is to, to adjust these control strategies and to uh, enter in opt-in or opt-out uh, commands as they need to. And we'll talk more about uh, how these strategies work in a minute. Um, second one is that through the utilities demand response automation server, they're able to uh, get a look at um, information about events that have occurred in the past, ones that are scheduled for the future, and what their, um, their response was to previous events. And lastly, there's the, um, the bidding process that I described earlier. So I'll talk a little bit about the one on the top here having to do with adjusting control strategy, and that's shown on the next slide here. So this is a, a look at the uh, table at which um, the energy manager at the installation is able to make these uh, control uh, current limit settings uh, that I mentioned earlier. So these settings can be adjusted um, by hour during the day, and this is set up for the hours of noon through uh, 8 p.m., which are the typical hours for demand bidding events. So these, uh, these uh, set points can be adjusted as needed by the uh, energy manager. Those would typically be varied a bit through the season to make sure you always get some reduction during an event. Um, also on this uh, page um, are the ability to uh, opt out from an event um, on a global scale or opt out uh, for a particular piece of equipment if uh, there's some sort of operational uh, constraint at the installation um, during an event. So, Okay, the next slide I'll move into describing the test design just a little bit. So in terms of the test here, um, due to the limited number of plants involved, three, um, we did not um, uh, set aside one as a, as a part of a control group. We used all of those as a test group. Um, and we applied the, the uh, DPP tariff and technology during the demonstration period and collected a set of um, relevant historical data that I'll describe in a minute and then uh, analyze this data, produce a set of metrics uh, to compare against the uh, stated performance objectives in the project. Next slide, uh, sampling results. Um, the next few slides, I'll be going through the performance results and uh, sam sample results on the project. So the, uh, the data that was collected consisted of the time of the event and the duration of the events. You'll see this in a minute. Uh, the current limit command that was sent to the equipment as a result of the 
um, of the event. That, that was that's represented in percent of rated load amps, and that's an indicator of the independent variable here, which is utilization of open ADR technology and the presence of a demand response event. And then we also collected um, measured data on the number of dependent variables, which change as a result of applying this technology and, and uh, the occurrence of, occurrence of an event. So things like the electric demand reduction in kilowatts, uh, the chiller current, actual current in percent of rated load, rated load amps to show that it responds to the commands that we sent to the equipment, and then also things like the chill water supply temperature, which we saw increase a little bit in some of the events as a result of the chiller demand limiting. So next slide shows an example of the measured data. So in this slide, um, you can see the uh, baseline uh, that uh, existed prior to the event. So in the days prior to, to an event, this particular chiller had uh, a, a, um, a typical uh, profile of around 125 kilowatts. Um, and with this, um, this conservative setback that we initiated uh, during that event, uh, it, you can see the reduction here it pulled down to around 115 kilowatts, uh, and then rising later during the event as we changed that uh, current limit setting. So the bottom half of this plot here you can see in brown was this current limit command that we sent the equipment. Uh, in the green dash line was the sort of the baseline of what the current limit had been typically in other days previous. And in the solid green line was the measured, um, the measured uh, current from the chiller. So you can see here that the the equipment um, responded to the commands that we sent. So next slide, uh, performance results. Um, I just laid out here the the question we sought to address in the demonstration, our hypothesis, and the criterion for acceptance. So. The demonstration question we sought to uh, answer here was, can this technology effectively enable an installation to participate in the markets or demand response programs more in general? And the hypothesis is that employing this uh, open ADR communication and control technology enables an installation to automate this demand response and accurately shed electric load from selected equipment during a uh, demand response event. So the acceptance criterion was that the equipment can accurately follow these commands that are issued by these pre-programmed strategies during an event, kind of as I showed on the slide just a minute ago. So in terms of measured results, um, as you saw on that slide and, and, and some others that are in the backup slides here and in the final report, the sampling results um, of the commands we sent to the chiller and the resulting response by the chiller showed very good tracking by the equipment. So as a result, we, we confirmed the um, hypothesis and, um, and then uh, therefore also uh, affirmatively answered the demonstration question uh, for the project. So, um, the next slide, the next slide shows the performance results against each of the performance objectives. So I'll go through each of these here and describe them briefly. Uh, performance objective number one was to reduce electric demand by the amount specified in the bid, and the way we measured that was, as I mentioned, um, um, measuring the response to the equipment. And so the results were that the chiller um, operating amperage current uh, track the commands that we sent very closely within this criteria of plus or minus 20 percent. Uh, actually, it was quite a bit closer than that. Um, so as a result, this performance objective was met based on our measurements. Um, performance objective number two was to maximize the bids across a typical year. Um, we had hoped to get a full season in and get a lot of events to respond to and collect data on. Um, we did get a few, uh, and, and so uh, we actually got a typical year's number of events, 
Um, and the results were that there were no instances of um, time periods when control loads are not available for use um, um, due to some sort of uh, failure in the equipment or some need to opt out uh, for um, some sort of constraint of the installation. So, you know, uh, we believe that um, military installations have a lot of loads that can be successfully bid into DR programs and to uh, wholesale uh, markets where they're available. So as, um, we feel that this performance objective was also met based on our experience in the demonstration. Uh, performance objective number three, uh, produce a recurring source of funds to invest in the infrastructure. Um, due to the limited uh, length of this um, demonstration and the, also the, the scale of our demonstration system, um, this is something we couldn't really effectively measure during the demonstration. Um, we, we're, the, the loads we're controlling are relatively small in size, and um, we really need uh, what, what we're working with um, DPW to do is to expand the scale, the size of the of the uh, of the um, automated demand response control system, to have it control. Um, much greater um, uh, load capability on the installation to enable them to uh, reduce their load more significantly and thereby um, uh, produce more economic benefit from this automated demand response. So um, uh, we weren't able to measure and demonstrate all of that during the project just due to the limited scale of, the, of this uh, demonstration. More or less it's a pilot and we we're working with DPW to expand the size of it. Okay, performance objective number four. Um, we wanted to make sure that the user interface was effective and usable by DPW operators. Um, our results were that the, their use of the system was quite limited. Um, they're busy people, so they kind of relied on us to do most of the demonstration work. So we didn't get um, a lot of feedback from them. They're getting more familiar with it now, um, and we'll be getting more feedback about that in the future. But we felt, based on the limited feedback that we were able to receive, we, we couldn't verify this particular uh, performance objective. OK, last one, performance objective number five, um, has to do with operation and maintenance um, of this control and communication equipment. Um, the, the objective here really is to uh, make sure that this technology is something that's um, easy to maintain and operate for the installation. Um, and uh, so our measure results here were that even though the instrument demonstration was rather short in duration, uh, we didn't experience any unexpected O&M costs or effort required. Um, this really is pretty much like a standard building energy management system with some slight addition for the uh, automated demand response. So it's really uh, something that's well proven and based on the experience that we've had elsewhere and what we found here with this demonstration, we feel that this performance objective was also met. So that's an overview of the performance reject, uh, objectives. Um, Next one, next few slides, I'm going to go through the, our, our cost assessment um, analysis. So the cost assessment uh, analysis um, was done in the following fashion. We, looking back to kind of the vision of how we see this technology being applied by military installations, in other words, using this technology to participate automatically in answer services market um, or in utility demand response programs. Those things result in credits on utility bills, uh, which produce um, funds that can be applied to procuring new or renewable energy, energy storage, other energy conservation measures. And it's out of those, as I mentioned, that come these uh, energy benefits that help installations meet their future uh, energy objectives. So in performing the life cycle cost assessment here, 
um, I broke the the LCC analysis into and process into three steps. Basically, the first step here is to invest in this. These are the kind of the kind of the steps that an installation would go through uh, as well here. So, um, the first step is to invest in the DBP control system and to enroll in um, a demand response program like DBP. So, for this analysis and using the LCC tool. Um, uh, the timing of that was um, to start in 2016. And then phase two is participate in the events uh, after the system is installed and um, uh, you know, begin to receive these uh, utility bill credits. That was also uh, assumed to begin in 2016 because it, doesn't, it, it takes only a few months to install these systems. And then uh, as those utility credits build up, Eventually, um, when we get to a positive cash flow, um, we can begin to apply those and invest those in other projects, renewable energy, other ECMs, and it's out of that that these benefits flow. So that's, that's phase three. So um, broke the LCC assessment into those three, uh, three phases. So the next couple of slides show the uh, the high-level results of the LCC analysis. Uh, one thing I want to, want to mention also here is um, the note I have on the bottom of slide 22 here shows that the ECM projects that we use in this analysis came out of a report, a study that was done by the uh, Erdux Searle Lab um, back in 2010 uh, of um, a number of ECM opportunities uh, at Fort, Fort Irwin. Just by chance, they had done uh, a study of the uh, opportunities at Fort Irwin. So we made uh, we, we made use of the results of um, of that report in uh, uh, in this analysis. Okay. So next slide, looking at the LCC results on what we call Phase One, which was installing the Open ADR. Um, so in this slide, you can see the metrics, the LCC metrics, um, savings to investment ratio, internal rate of return, simple payback, so on, for this uh, installation of open ADR. And the numbers here are calculated for uh, a couple of different discount rates. So these numbers are, are reasonably attractive. It shows a simple payback of less than three years. This is the kind of thing that we typically see in industry. and. Also, I wanted to mention that uh, this analysis assumes that the incentives available from the utility company were um, utilized uh, in this, um, what I call phase one installation of um, open ADR uh, in this cost assessment. So the, the numbers here really are based on a total of uh, 5,000 kilowatts of demand that can be partially reduced when needed uh, the the 5,000 5, kilowatts is uh, only a portion of the total load at Fort Irwin, and the, the numbers here are, are based on a maximum reduction of about of, of 8% of that 5,000 kilowatts or 4% uh, during cooler months. And those numbers are in line with uh, what's typically seen in similar projects in the commercial sector. Okay, moving along to the results of looking at the ECM projects, basically the investments that can be made uh, using the utility bill credits. So there were, as I mentioned, three projects here that came out of the, the Searle study that was done at Fort Irwin. Uh, first one was an HVAC controls project, and uh, I'll show in a minute the, sort of the timeline of the, of the cash flows here, but Timing-wise, uh, in this sort of uh, simulated um, sequence of projects, uh, the cash flow would have enabled that investment to be made in, in 2020 after the uh, original uh, investment in, in ADR had been uh, paid off. Uh, so then, uh, and then um, in the following year, 2021, would be an investment in some boiler controls in Building 263 and then in the following year, 2022, would be an investment in a solar project in Building 325. 
So uh, you can see the, uh, the metrics here, the savings to investment ratio, the internal rate of return, and the simple payback for each of those projects. Those were all pretty good projects um, on their own, as pointed out in the Searle study. <clears throat> and uh, um, I should point out that these were some of the more attractive uh, projects in that Searle study. Um, others could have been chosen, um, but those are the ones we selected. Okay, uh, next slide. Number 25 shows this uh, timeline and this of uh, the cash flows here. So as you can see, there's an, there's an investment in year one for the installing the system and some uh, cash flow in, in year one. Um, the blue lines here are annual cash flows or net cash flows. Um, so that uh, po the cash flow becomes uh, positive then in um, year two, as you can see that the, the uh, blue line is, a, the blue bar is above the zero line there, but um, it takes until 2020 to save up enough um, of these credits to make this first investment, uh, as I mentioned, in project number one. Project number one has a, has a very good uh, uh, payback and generates some, uh, some pretty good savings. So um, that enables um, an investment together with the ADR savings that continue through the project to invest in the second one project and then similar for, for um, uh, the third project in 2022. Um, I didn't carry this out any further than that. Um, the ADR system would have a, a lifetime of at least 10 years, um, and it would, uh, this, by the way, does include some cost for O&M on the ADR system. So what's shown here is the, the net cash flow from the ADR. And uh, each of the ECMs also has a, uh, recurring uh, O&M cost, but that's also factored in here. So in each case, we're we're showing the net cash flows from each of those. So um, other additional projects could be uh, procured in the following years. So it's a pretty good story here. Um, but the the key here is um, having the investment in ADR and using it as a vehicle to to fund these. Uh, additional programs in the future that from which come the energy and sustainability uh, benefits we talked about. Okay, uh, so um, next slides here are just some notes here about um, issues to address in applying the technology. So a couple things that we recommend, things that we um, learned during the project. So. Um, one important thing is to um, take a look at the DR program economic benefits and front end financial incentives that are offered by utility provider or the grid operator. There are different options that are available. Utilities each have different, uh, each utility has different uh, DR programs that are available and there are different ways to participate in the wholesale markets, kind of as was shown on one of the earlier slides. So it's important for installation to look at the opportunities that are out there, see which ones fit uh, their particular situation the best. Second one is interfacing with the building energy management system. Um, that's the best way to interface with the uh, loads that you're going to control. Uh, you can also control other loads on the installation that might be, not, might, might, might be say, um, water or wastewater loads, if those are available and those will be controlled through some other system probably. So those opportunities can be looked at as well. Third thing to, to think about is uh, there may be extensions needed to the military communications network. At the installation, we ran into that here. Uh, part of the project, we had to um, have the communication network extended to reach, reach some of the points we were controlling. We, we worked with the Network Enterprise Center at uh, Fort Irwin to get um, those extensions made, and those were done under this project. Um, fourth thing to, to um, keep in mind is um, depending on the requirements of the um, Network Enterprise Center at the installation, um, 
we found that uh, NEC required uh, for Fort Irwin that the system be um, installed on the military network. They um, did want did not want us to install a separate private network. So uh, that required us to have, of course, an authorization to operate, which we had um, in, in interim form, and eventually it was um, uh, brought up to full uh, ATO form uh, for the project. So it's important to acquire a DIACAP or ATO <coughs> certification if that's not already in place. And last point here is uh, we recommend doing an upfront uh, demand response audit of the installation. Do a complete one and really look uh, very closely at all the uh, opportunities that are available at the installation. Okay, next slide about technology transfer. So there are a number of um, um, audiences here we need to address, um, the DOD end users. Um, so there are tariffs available from the utilities, there are grid participation opportunities, um, and those are available in, in many areas right now. It's a matter of each installation looking at what the opportunities are in their case. So DOD end users, um, the outreach there is through technical reports from this project and uh, also um, just uh, communication at um, conferences and so forth in the future. So um, our final report and the CNP report, as mentioned earlier, are currently under review and will be posted, uh, posted soon. And the last uh, audience is regulators. Uh, they're an important part of the uh, of this process as well. So the status on that is that OpenADR uh, protocol, the enabling technology here, um, has been uh, entered into the NIST uh, catalog of standards. It's being uh, applied in, in um, uh, most areas of the, of the U.S. right now. So this technology is, is available at this time. As I mentioned earlier, it's being used in the commercial sector, and uh, it's, now it's, it's, uh, it's available for use by installations. Okay, next slide, uh, publications. Uh, we um, have had no publications, uh, external publications under this project uh, to this point. Uh, we don't envision any uh, at this point as well. Uh, patents, we have two patents that were uh, filed for under this project. The titles are shown here. They related to our development of the uh, the control um, operator screen that I showed earlier. And then awards, um, none to date at this point. Okay. Next slide, social media. Um, we have not uh, discussed the project on social media to this point. Um, just hasn't been uh, um, a good opportunity to do so. Um, so we have no links to share on that. Next slide, uh, PA con PI contact information. Um, my information is shown here. Uh, Melanie's information and uh, Janie's as well. <coughs> 